Hey everyone, Adam Savage here in my cave with, uh, well, I'm keeping with these themed builds of multi-parts of the same project. And behind me you see the Iron Man Mark I with his uh, new arc reactor and chest construction and Magneto on the back. And, well, there's a lot of work to do on that guy. And it's definitely not gonna happen in a single day, but I do have a one day build, which is the next thing I wanted to do on that which is to make the helmet more uh, 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 screen accurate. And right now the helmet is a single piece of resin. I believe this has been poured in onyx, if I'm correct. That's a, a thicker urethane resin plastic. And the helmet looks great. There's, I'm, I'm actually quite pleased with how it looks. I know some of the dents aren't correct. That doesn't really bother me. What I wanna do is I want to, uh, make this helmet function like the one in the film, which is that it'll separate here and lift up. And that's gonna require some, a bunch of engineering. First off, I'll need to be able to mount this helmet on my head where whatever is attached to my head is only mounted on the back. Then I'm gonna need to work out how it closes and opens because it will need to close and stay there and will need to open and stay there and both of those, uh, yeah, there's stuff to engineer with both of those functions. Uh, and then there's the interior, because recently um, one of these helmets was auctioned off and I got a look at some pictures of its interior and I'm gonna use those for reference because uh, its interior seems to be lined in the very particular type of leather that welding jackets are made out of, which makes complete sense. That's exactly what Tony Stark would have lined his Mark I helmet in. And I've got some, I've got this extra pair of, what do you call, what do you call sleeves? Are these arm chaps? They might actually be arm chaps. I've never thought of chaps as leg, in de, leg dependent. I'm just, anyway, I think these are arm chaps. I've got an old pair. I'm gonna cut them up and use them to line this. Uh, and also the, the skull cap that is on Tony's head, you can see is clearly made from the same material. So some internal structure, some external structure, some magnets and some closure. And hopefully by the end of this project, we'll have a really nice Iron Man Mark I helmet. Yeah, let's get started. Um, it's It occurs to me that you might be wondering why I'm wearing a, a what do you, uh, there it is, 99th Infantry Division um, World War II Army jacket. And it's only because I managed to, I came across one on an auction site uh, that was in my size for a real deal, 38 regular, and it fits like a glove. I, that's the only explanation I have. Where we start with this is, I think I gotta cut it in half. I think that's the first thing. Then I'm gonna give the, I'm gonna give, I think, the back just a little bit of a lip and I'm going to use some magnets uh, to hold this together and then I'm probably going to cut out this entire arrangement over here I'm probably going to look for reference cut that out and remake that um, in Delrin black plastic so that I can embed hinging into here correctly Right, so it's cutting it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and then actually there's this other thing and I do know how I'm gonna do this. So uh, like I said, I need to be able to mount only the back part to my head. And the way I'm gonna do that is by using a piece of this uh, nice wide flat aluminum. This is uh, this is inch and a half hardware store aluminum. Um, it's a nice, basically what I'm gonna do is I'm going to make, a, take a piece of this and mount it to a circular piece of this. This will be done uh, bent around as like a halo to fit over my head. And that'll connect to this, which will connect to the bottom part of the helmet back here. Yeah. Those are the current plans. How am I gonna cut this apart? Oh, the bone saw. Uh, so, this is the saw that I'm about to use. 
Um, it is, I think, generally known as a reciprocating air saw. Uh, it's got this blade out here. It is, it's fast. Um, this is stunning for cutting apart castings just like this. And you'll see, actually, yeah, you'll see right now because I'll do it right in front of you. satisfying. Isn't that great? Um, I used a saw just like this to cut up the fiberglass castings for the big buildings in Topoca City for episode two. That is where I first learned about that saw and immediately went and bought one. I have three now. It's not because I needed three. They've just they've used them on different projects and I lost one for a little while and then found it again. That is fascinating. Okay, so now we have this. Now, I think the first thing to realize, yeah, so right away, when we cut apart two halves, we end up with a fitment issue because, because they line up on one side, but not, oh, do they line up okay on the other side? Oh, they do, okay. Uh, it's a little spongy. There's a lot, these things, um. These move around a bit. Sometimes when you cut apart something, you'll release internal tensions and the pieces won't come back together. You just have to be prepared that that could happen. Um, I'm gonna go get some of my reference material. Well, no, I don't need to worry about the hinge arrangement. I just wanna worry about this bit, that. That's the next part, right, okay. So. I've got a casting of my head here. I'm going to use it to do the bending. And my goal is to bend it just a little bit farther out than this foam. I think this will be the liner. Uh, but I can get very specific with my head shape here, and that's great. And bending metal like this, one of my favorite things to do. Talked about it before, on tested. Oh, do I want... But, but, Eh, I don't care. It's just a matter of increments. It's incremental. It's iterative. You just got to give over to the process. Okay. Yep. Ah, it's nice to know my head is the same shape it was when I was 25. Yeah. Now I could make this I could make it tight. Uh, I'm going to have a leather liner in it. I'm going to have a piece coming up here that goes like that. Or maybe do I want it here instead? The fact is is that there's very little parity between the actual prop and likely what Downey wore on set. Um, oh yeah, I guess I could do it like that. And then that gives me some room to move, just like that. Okay, I'm gonna do that. Sorry, I'm aware that, well, it's important to be aware that like for any kind of thing like Iron Man's Mark I helmet, there's gonna be like 10 different versions of the thing. There's gonna be the one that's on the big walk around suit. There's gonna be one that Robert Downey wears. There's gonna be one for a shot in which the helmet comes up. There's gonna be one for a shot where it goes down. I swear, it's like there might be different ones for every single one of those. But I did notice that Downey seems to, it seems to be almost like a little, like a skull cap, which is not realistic for being able to hold a bulletproof helmet on your head, right? But that's fine. I'm gonna go a little bit lower like that. 
Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to drive four rivets from the inside through the outside. That'll be still a smooth surface on the inside. Yeah, and uh, then I'll start to build some more structure from there. First I drill one of the holes, then I rivet it, then I drill the others. That way I don't end up with any misalignments. Yeah. Great. Now I'll drill the second hole. Now I've got some really nice thin stuff here. This is uh, about a sixteenth of an inch. This is ah, the same exact thickness. And this is what I'll come up over the, over the top, this right here. And we will, we will make a mark. center. Excellent. And we'll place that on the outside. Oh, right. Okay. So here, this will be nifty. My camera's actually clamped right in front of the bandsaw, so just like put my arms around you. Yep. This aluminum that I'm using for this, it's my bread and butter aluminum. It's hardware store aluminum. Nothing special about it. Uh, it's not even very strong, but it's perfect for a whole host of little projects. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm just gonna do one here. Yeah, I don't want that many bumps. Actually, I wanna smooth that out. All right, so I just smoothed this out a little bit to remove whatever visual uh, evidence might exist, I guess. All right, put the rivet in there. I'm not gonna set it just yet. And I'm gonna use that as the guide. plate on this because what I need from it is a sheer strength. Now I've got this, right, which is this, um, these two little nubbins here. I'm going to take those down. Nice and thin. I'm very happy about that. Uh, I'm going to smooth out the other edges of this thing. Okay. Hey. 
yeah, with a little padding, a little padding that could be quite comfortable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Phineas and Ferb hair. There it is. Oh, right. The height it's at has to be where my eyes can see out of it. Well, there you go. It's funny. This um, the, the replica I have is actually more beat up than the original is. But to be honest, I think I can make this work. Uh, carve out a little bit on the eyes, reduce a little bit here. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. That's not where I want to go yet. Mm, this is going to be so much fun to paint. This, what I'm going to do here is give a little bend to here and then a down, and then that will mount to the back side of this thing. Now, how will it mount to the back side of this thing is the question. And it's a really good question. Thank you for asking. It. I think the answer is I'm gonna bend another piece to go back here. Yep, and then that'll go nice and low. And so I'll just cut that there and we'll bend that. I hope you don't mind I'm doing the cutting off camera. You've seen cutting. Another bending. Another bending thing. Here we go. What I've got is that curve and I want to replicate it. Uh, one of the first steps I take. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'm clamped into the vise. So, again, I want to talk about bending metal because it's. So, here's the first bend. It's just that. Just a little bit. Just a little tiny bit of a bend. But that's just to kind of get the ball rolling and see where I'm at. And then I just keep on, dude, not bad. I'm eventually gonna epoxy the crap out of this in there. Um, you don't have to make a sound effect with every bend. But honestly, it helps. Okay, so now I can start to bend my hand once I got that end done. And, yep. Oh, yeah. You, you'll, you'll end up being kind of amazed how little of a difference, sorry, how, how gentle you can actually get and have significant shifts upon the material. And eventually you get a feel for it. And you get a taste for it. And you have a talent for it. Then you get paid for it. Um, the other advantage to putting in a piece of uh, aluminum like that is that now I can actually mount some magnets to this and I can adjust the, the, the width of the helmet's base. All of that is a net good for me. 
before I glue that in, however, I am definitely, definitely going to uh, tooth it up. So what I've got is a little bit of uh, resin that's bubbling up right here. So I'm just going to carve. I guess I could just carve the resin away. That would be easier. Oh, much better, much better, much better. Okay, great. So that's good. I like that. Now I'm going to clamp that in. So now I'm going to join the top head piece here and the side piece and my back offshoot piece all to each other. That's the, uh, yeah, that's what'll get all this going. Since this is where most of the engineering, this is, there's a lot of force on this lever here, right? Because the whole helmet's hanging off this one point. Uh, so I'm going to want to use, I think, longer. Oh, no, I can get a backing plate on that one. Great. There we go. That, look, it's not super pretty, but that is uh, smooth on the inside. And that is a really nice, strong holder for all of that, that business. Yeah, so now, now I'm gonna do a little bit of bending on this. Gonna go, uh, not a lot, just a little, and uh, see where we get with that. Actually, I just wanna see something here. One and one. If the head is back here, and these are here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so that is, um, it's about an inch off. Let's try that. I can adjust. I'm gonna put a real gentle bend right there. Gentle bend. Now I don't have a lot of meat to grab onto. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna, I'm actually gonna put a, a, a cold chisel over here and hit it with a hammer to kind of bend this up right like that. One thing about hardware store aluminum, it's not gonna take us, like if you have to bend it and then bend it back and you wanna bend it again, not gonna happen. Now I'm gonna do the same thing a little lower down. Not too much. Yeah, just like. And now I can put the whole flat of this against here. Give it a good, uh, give it a good swacking. I guess it's got to go up. Wow. This, this is messing with my eyes. Let me just get rid of this piece of foam. Yes. I got no one else to go. Name the movie. Trivia question.
I need these to be um, super narrow, so I'm not going to put backing plates on them. I'm just going to use five of these things, and that should get me all the way. Still respectively close. I'm really happy about that. Um, it's uh, so that going on. Nope. Actually, 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 I can mount this. I can. Uh, pretty good that's pretty good so let's see if this sits there like this on my head and then I bring this over here and it sits there well ladies and gentlemen damn damn yeah nailed it all right good I'm very happy about that this is heavy is what this is but I guess I could put, oh yeah, yeah, there we go. Right, I could have a nice, yeah, great. Neck pad back there, and then that will hold this in its right orientation. So let me draw out where I'm gluing this. Yeah, there's a lot of, I wonder if I just pull out that middle section and then I only do that as the hand. I think that may make more sense. I just have to work out what that hinge looks like. And I don't think I've got a lot of top of the head reference material. I've got a reference of it opened up up here. Ha! Ha ha ha! Ha ha! Ha ha! Ah, so, sorry. Um, remember how I said I was thinking I would have little magnets down here to help the front of the helmet connect with the back of the helmet? What is that? That's exactly what that is. That's a magnet connector right there, and I'm sure there's a corresponding one right there. Now, I said I didn't want to glue this in there without, quote, toothing it up. So what that means is, got a smooth surface on the back of this and a smooth surface on the inside of this, except for some of this business. And none of that is great for gluing. I, I need surface area for gluing. So I'm gonna hit this on my uh, belt sander and rough it all up here. I'm not gonna sand through the rivets. I'm gonna rough it up and it'll give lots more surface area for my epoxy to grab. That's what I'd call toothed up.
Okay, uh, so I've noticed one thing, which is that the face, my face is a little bit, I'd like the face to be just a little bit narrower, just like that. That little tiny difference is gonna make a lot of difference to me. So I'm gonna put a piece of aluminum in here that will allow me to not only pull it in just a little bit, but it will also allow me to shape it to this back piece. And it gives me a space to mount my magnets too. Bingo, it's exactly what I need. Um, so, that's the wrong way. So I'm just gonna get these all fitted up and kitted up and then I'm gonna break out the epoxy. You guys can all wait till later. I don't think that'll work at all. One of the difficulties with glues in shops is that um, they dry, they dry out, and that can happen, and that's real. Okay, so that's the way that one wants to go. It doesn't want to go this way. Is that really clear? Yeah, it's really clearly not that. So that's up, and I'm just gonna, yeah. And that is definitely up. So. So a bunch of my epoxy uh, gun system uh, tubes have, one of them split in here. It's awful, it's really gross. But I have one last working one and it should be able to set itself by tomorrow, which is what I need. And I'm just gonna go in and, yeah. Epoxy it in, there we go. Great. Uh, I can operate these. And I think I can operate these. Now I want to fill in the gaps. The more gap filling I have, the better off my gluing will be. The reason I'm coating both sides is to make sure I get proper coverage. Uh, you can easily screw stuff up if you don't do that. I think I got a, oh yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm running out of pot life here on the mixture, so I gotta go faster, because it can set inside the mixer tip um, and I still have some working life, but it gets thicker and it gets harder to adjust. So here we go. Let's get this guy in there and get another. That's what I wanted. This is the end. I'm at the end of the day and this is nice. I'll, this will set up all night long. 
and that's exactly what I want. Seriously, I could probably have done this with a little Velcro, um, but I, you know, I'm looking for an experience, not just a, a replica. Wow, it's setting already. Okay, end of the day. Let's head on home. Good, good, good morning, JF. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my epoxy has set. The helmet pieces now have some structure to them. Uh, it's now time to work out this hinge mechanism up top here. Uh, get, it, uh, get it actually going so that this lifts up. And also the magnet closure system actually follows that. Anyway, uh, sorry, the epoxy has set. I've ordered new epoxy to replace all the busted epoxy that I've got here in the shop. And uh, like I said, it is now time to work out this top hinge. Yep. And then once I got the top hinge, the magnet closures and we're moving along. Sometimes these videos can be unsatisfying because in the middle of the video, I reveal the thing that looks just like it did in the beginning of the video, but much has changed. So um, I cut out a detail section here and replaced it with Delrin and made a little two pin hinge because a single pin wouldn't allow this to pivot over its center and sit on top. But now I have this two pin hinge that does so I have screwed that hinge to the inside and there's a magnet on both sides so that it actually, it actually holds. I, I mean, I, you know, it's not super strong, but first of all, this feels great, right? Like looking around, it's awesome. Flipping it up, all of a sudden, I'm dramatically doing exposition and then I bring it back down and I'm escaping from the prison, yeah. So, um, there is a thing I wanted to show you, and I've got some reference material here, and one piece of reference I have, some of the dings aren't accurate, some of them are, um, but I've got a, a, a dent here on the back side. It's right about here. Comes like that. So, this is a, a urethane resin plastic. And as such, uh, it's what you call a thermoset resin. You mix the two parts together, they create an exothermic reaction, they create heat, that heat changes the chemical composition of the resin and it hardens, boop, and you get plastic. There are thermoset plastics like this, which means you bring them to a temperature and they change their properties. And then there's thermo thermoplastics, thermosets and thermoplastics. And thermoplastics, Am I getting this wrong? At any rate, there are two classes. One that like you can reheat and reshape and one you can't. And like vacuform plastic is a thermoplastic. You can reheat it as many times as you want. Its properties will always be roughly the same. Yes, with caveats for polycarbonate and hygroscopic uh, materials like acrylic. However, don't despair because the thermoset resins can be affected by heat and I'm gonna show you. Um, so what I wanna do is I wanna put this dent in here uh, and I'm gonna use a, I think this wooden block to create the dent. But how am I gonna soften this up? I could carve it out with a Dremel and build it up behind, but a heat gun will do just as well. Um, this is a Milwaukee heat gun. I, no shop should be without a blow dryer. And most shops should also have a heat gun. I'll just, I'll just say that. Every shop ev that makes anything should have a blow dryer just in case. And most shops should also have a heat gun that goes to a much higher heat. 
You just, there's a lot of applications in which you want that high heat. So what I'm gonna do to heat this up is I'm going to localize the, the heat here on this mark, but I'm gonna be feeling it with my fingers from behind the mark. So behind the mark is where I'll be able to determine that it's soft enough to take the dent I wanna put in it. Here we go. I've got it on its high heat setting, which seriously would burn you any closer than this for more than a couple of seconds. It gets very, very hot. So I've just got my heat gun on here and I've got my hand behind it and I'm feeling for the heat transfer. And I'm trying not to like get so close in, I'm bubbling the pain or anything. I'm just trying to gently, I'm, it's like you're cooking meat. I'm moving, I'm moving the temperature through, through the thing that I want to heat up. So now I can start to feel the heat behind the resin. This is also a great way, by the way, to reshape resin castings that you might have that have gotten misshapen, which can certainly happen in a hot car and all sorts of other circumstances. So now I've got some heat on it. And if you look, you can see that as I push on it, I'm making, see that? Now that's how soft that is. So now I'll take this, I'm gonna drive it in here. Oh, you know what? I need um, something to protect my hand now. Okay, now I've lost enough heat. I'm gonna add some more heat to this equation. And then I'm gonna take this piece of wood and I'm gonna try and make myself this little dent. Am I, am I being crazy? You know what, let's try it this way. Yeah, that's better. You can see you've got a lot of room to kind of move here. You've got, you can almost sculpt. And I'm, you know, I'm looking at the surrounding areas and making sure they're not too, they're not too uh, out of shape that I haven't like overdone it. But I think, yeah, I think that's a pretty reasonable down actually, I think, yeah. There we go. And there, there's your dent. Now I will, uh, obviously this whole thing will get another coat of paint. Uh, I think I do need to give this thing a coat of black on the inside and I guess a good black on the outside because I want a, a tablo rasa for painting. Um, so if I give this whole thing a coat of black and then I go in and do my leather work on the inside, then I can do the nice chrome paint finish on the outside here with some translucent uh, blues and some translucent browns and then some rust weathering. And we should have ourselves a nice, a nice, a uh, nice prop here. Yeah. All right. We have, I know I said I was going to do the inside first and then I kind of got excited about painting and I kind of drifted towards the painting. I know, I know, I should do the, the lining first because that's the, it's the tougher part of the job, I think, or the less fun. However, um, I gave this thing a coat of gloss black spray paint. I gave it a coat inside of some black. Uh, yeah, that'll get covered with leather. Um, and I just wanted to see it with a shiny, with a shiny coat. Um, normally, I would be waiting to paint this until it was time to paint the whole thing. However, one of the points of the Mark I is that it is chock-a-block, that it is a calico uh, uh, robot suit. Uh, and so I don't have to worry about matching anything, truly. Uh, and I was toying around with the idea of using a rattle can chrome on this. Rattle can chromes have gotten amazing in the past few years, but I am still gonna use Molto, my favorite mirror chrome, uh, and I'm gonna spray it out of the, my new Iwata airbrush. And the reason is I've got some, 
Uh, it is easy to take down the value of Chrome, but really hard to up the value of Chrome. Uh, and I know that I have uh, a reliable sealer in the AllClad 2 sealer. All of that is a long way of saying, if I'm going to be dressing the inside of this, I need the outside to be completely dry and handleable. And my experience with the Molto and the AllClad is, that's what you get. And with a rattle can, yeah, that, yeah, I, I, yeah, no. So we're gonna do some airbrushing. I've uh, got some, uh, the Moto refill and I'm shaking it up. Okay, here we go. I'm spraying this straight out of the airbrush. Yep. That's what's happening. I'm spraying straight out. I'm not even thinning this down. Not bad, not bad. I don't want you to tip over. That's my thing. All right. Clean this out a little bit. Holy cow. Dude, look how freaking shiny that is. That's freaking crazy is what it is. Let's clean this out. Okay, so I'm going to let this dry for a few minutes and then I'm going to hit it with the all clad clear. I swear you can see your face in it. Look at that. Look at that. You can almost see. Yeah. 
If I wasn't wearing pants, I'll bet you could tell using this. What a weird metric. Anyway, I'm super happy with this chrome. We're gonna give it a, um, a nice coating of the All Clad 2 lacquer gloss clear coat, ALC 310. This is the stuff I like for covering a Molto. I'm not sure it'll stay this super high reflection. I'm not sure it will stay this reflective, but it will stay pretty darn reflective. And I also gotta make sure the paint underneath is dry. Oh yeah, there we go. Oh, amazing. Okay. Um, when you want a good chrome, you always have to start with a really good gloss black. Um, normally you'd make sure to have it be a featureless and really pristine. That is not an issue with Iron Man's Mark I helmet. Um, damn, that is, I gotta say, I'm just really kind of stoked at how pretty that is. Okay, time for painting. It is really amazing how well this all clad lacquer sealer works with the Molto, man. It's sort of mind blowing. Let's start to look at the color accents here. Uh, I'm gonna take a look at my reference. Now, there seems to be uh, a mixture here of a rusty umber, probably burnt and raw, in the, in the corners, like near the welds, uh, with the welds being relatively clean. I can clean those welds up later, and also on the back there's some dirt in the in the holes, in the, in the dents. Um, all this looks very realistic. Uh, I can easily add Molto Chrome to these high spots later, um, but I think that what I wanna try and do right now is airbrushing in acrylic on this. I have some, uh, I have some acrylic paint that ought to work just poured straight into the thing, and I'm gonna try and do some of this, uh, some of this rusty rust in the corners. I don't have the, the right side. Huh. Well, sometimes you get these references and you get both sides, but in this one, I think they've only photographed the right side. Um, yeah, terrific. It is mostly dry. Um,
All right, I've been having some fun. Um, I started out with a acrylic airbrush of some, uh, uh, what do you call this, raw umber here in the edges. Then I uh, let that dry and I pulled some of it back with rubbing alcohol, very, very light touch of rubbing alcohol. Uh, then I used some oil paint to get some dirt in here and you can see how, how nicely the dirt sort of settles into the corners. I mean, it's really nice. It delineates the lines, but there's an aspect to this that I really want to get right now. Um, and it is the fact that there's like a blue, there's a, a very, very blue tinge to the whole thing. And I'm gonna replicate that. So what I've got here is a clear Tamiya blue acrylic. And I'm gonna try that right out of my airbrush and see if it gets me what I'm looking for. Again, it's a super light touch that I'm gonna shoot for here. This is like, this is like the miscoloration of all the welding, right? Let's see here. We've got a clear, oh, this clear blue is lovely. Okay, so. Okay, so uh, here we go. We're just gonna try and give it a, a little bit of a tinge here. Just trying to, I'm not trying to be super regular. I'm just trying to get a little bit of a, of a color just to cool it down. If you see the blue, I've gone too far. Oh, oh I see a little bit of blue. Okay. So that's nice that I've got it on the bottom there, but not the top. That's very subtle. I think I didn't go. Yeah, it's very subtle. Oh, I'll have to kill that a little bit. Oh yeah, that's kind of awesome. Yeah, okay. It's just about looking, I mean, even looking at it in, at it on camera is helping me see where I could use a little bit. Let's get some up in here. Yeah, 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 that's great. Okay, yeah, I will kill, actually, you know what? I think I'm good with blue. I think I am pretty good with the blue. I'm glad I had a clear blue. I thought I did, then I couldn't find it. Then I found it. What a great story. Got a little too much blue up here. I'm gonna try and kill it on that edge with just a little bit of rubbing alcohol. That's it. Yep, see that? Okay. So what I could do is I take the rubbing alcohol and I just hit the high spots and that gets rid of some of that blue and also helps to kind of call out the difference. I'm feeling pretty good. Now we're gonna go for a little burnt sienna and I'm just gonna experiment with it into the, into the corners of everything. Uh, oh, right, I just wanna get a little more, let's see here. I mean, one of the things that I'm doing is I'm just continuing to add like just really subtle layers of kind of weathering and then pulling it up and then adding it and then yanking it back off. 
and it's just about sort of changing up the textural differences. Yeah, see that? That's great. And it's slightly different than the airbrush and also slightly different like matteness, matte value. And it also helps. That's nice. That is a nice looking little bit of rust going on. Let's get some into these holes here. Yeah, take that. Yep, yep, yep. That's great. As always, ooh, boo -boo -toe. hey! As always, make sure you don't drop the thing that you're painting while you're painting it. Just a helpful little, helpful little art hint there. It helps when you're making something not to drop it. This is also not bad training for the Mando helmet. This is definitely um, the kind of paint job that that also does really well with. You know, that sort of, that sort of sand dirt going on. Oh yeah, that third color just immediately starts to kind of like show up and make some awesome stuff happen. And I'm being much more randomized about it because what's happening is so much better than anything I could kind of plan. I mean, it's just a, I'm getting some kind of, yes, yes. I'm actually using the camera to help me see where to, where to go. Yep, right there, right there. That was that was a thing. If you uh, if you watch the time lapses, you'll notice that like I use I use some cloth, I use some cotton applicator, cotton tip applicators. I use my finger. I use paper towels. Uh, the more different things you can use to blot and dab and move your paint around, the less it's going to look like you've put it on. With a, you're removing all the evidence of a thing that put the finish there. I love that moment at which um, I'm like looking at something and I'm almost about to put it away, but I've still got a little bit of paint and I've still got a finger and some. And it's this, it's this lovely dance. And then there's this point at which, first of all, there's always a point at which I'm like, this is totally not working. And then there's a point at which it's like, it's starting to work. And then there's a point very shortly after that where you're like, it worked! <laughs> oh, this paint job has been the most fun. It has exceeded my expectations. It feels... I mean, I'm getting an experience from looking at it right in front of me that feels quite authentic. It feels very much like what it is representing. And I'm super ecstatic about the fact that it's fully operational. Um, I am now going to start working on the leather. However, wrinkle, because I used oil paint, it's gonna take a while for it to dry. So I'm gonna put a blow dryer on it for a little while and noodle with some other stuff around here in the shop. And it may even be tomorrow morning before I get to this. Uh, there's about seven coats of paint on this. There's a black primer, a black gloss, a clear gloss, couple of coats, and then there's the Molto, then there's the sealer. Uh, I, you know, I'm impatient. So I didn't wait for every layer to dry, which means now it's harder for all of it to flash off, but it will eventually, and this will be a nice hard surface. Um, and I, I'm super excited. You know, there, oh, wow, look at that, that's great. There's a thing about this, which is, if I hold it up to this drawing, you can see the ways in which it is close and the ways in which it is far. It is a little uh, more squat 
and wide than the original. And there are some topological, topographical, excuse me, details uh, that aren't exact. That's fine with me. There's a certain point with a piece where I'm gonna stop trying to follow the model and I'm just gonna try and get the piece to be right to itself. And I really feel like I'm close to that here. I really feel like I'm, I'm very close. I, I'm just always looking at what needs addressing, but for the most part, oh man, it is a, it's a good looking piece. And uh, it gets me super excited about painting the entirety of that guy back there. So next step is the leather. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I thought I was recording the sewing of this and I wasn't. But what I ended up with is this. Uh, hopefully this is enough for me to, yeah. So uh, yeah, I guess the next step is for me to just try and finagle this over my little headdress thing here without scarifying my my paint job from the other day. This is, yeah, this is uh, non-trivial. Ah, that's what I need. I need longer needle nose. That's terrible. This, I hate it. I hate it. I'm changing the look. It's just, it's just horrendous. This, this is like someone cut up a basketball and stuck it in my Iron Man helmet. It's just not working for me. Garbage. Uh, okay, so now what do I do? Well, one thing we can do is I can... Uh, I can put this in. And maybe the best thing to put it in And then what I could do is I could take a long strip here. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a long strip and I'm going to hot glue it in to itself. Suede hot glues nicely to itself. So we're going to do that. That's gonna look a lot better, much better. Okay, so uh, we're gonna put a little hot glue on here, and a little bit of hot glue inside that seam. And right. yeah, that's gonna look much better. And then this whole thing comes up in here. And I am going to need to do a little bit of trimmage. The line of trimmage and this one also. No, no, that one can, that one can do it. It's just this last little bit here. I could still take off a little extra. Take off a full like 5 sixteenths off of the whole thing.
Yes. Okay, I think that looks much more respectable. It's time to dress the inside of the face. Okay, I am not sure I have enough fabric left over, but I guess there's only one way to find out. I have another one of these jackets, which I can cut up, should I need to. I'm not exactly sure how it fits in the way that it's set to fit, but we'll get something pretty close. And that's gonna be the easy part. This is definitely gonna be the hard part. And I'm gonna do these, this, I'm gonna do these, uh, what I call wet. All right, so. Yeah, I, this is one of the better fitting costume helmets I've used. Oh yeah, I need the, you want to see the headroom. So, got the helmet on, put it up, relatively stays put. If it doesn't, you got to catch it because man, that's going to clamp down. It's working just as I said, like a welding helmet. This, I know this is in canon and I know that 
these cross pieces should be darker leather, but <clears throat> I didn't like the look of the darker leather. Uh, I don't think, I know Tony's into aesthetics, but I'm not sure he would have taken the time. However, I now feel like I have taken the proper amount of time and made this Iron Man helmet my Iron Man helmet. Uh, I'm gonna go put it on. Now, there are a lot of little things to do on this guy. <laughs> there are a lot of little things to do on this guy, but, mate, I'm working on a joke. I'm not gonna quit while I'm ahead. I'm gonna move forward. Iron Man's head is finished. I think it's beautiful. Uh, it will be high time for his body to get another paint job. However, there's an extensive amount of rebuilding to do on both of the legs to make them more accurate. The right boot right now is fairly accurate. The left boot, that'll be a different one day build. Then there are some electronics to worry about and then we'll do a paint job. Uh, it's likely to be two more one day builds. One doing some fabrication work on him and the second being the finished paint job, which will be an all day glorious affair. I cannot wait to paint this thing. I can only tell you that the geniuses at Legacy FX uh, work in uh, formerly Stan Winston Studios. Uh, I'm sure that whoever got to paint this bot was super psyched about it because this is the most fun kind of paint job. Chock-a-block calico handmade by Tony Stark built this in a cave. Thank you guys for joining me for this one day build. And we will see you next time. Oh, he's nodding in a... Wow, I didn't even plan that. All right, guys. Thanks.